Hi, Benny. I'm all right. I'm having a great time. Do you have a question already? Oh, you'd like to open the questions? We have a long-standing policy that you can't call shotgun until you see the car. But I'll keep that in mind. This is kind of those deep because you your question was, can you ask the first question? Yeah, it's a lot of layers. Uh, coach first, and then the players come in. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the main interview room. Our Texas Tech media availability session is set to begin in just a few moments. At 1.50 or so, head coach Chris Beard will join us here in the main interview room for your questions and his answers. After a few moments with Coach Beard by himself, we'll be joined by student athletes Jarrett Culver and Norin Zodiase. Following our media availability in this room, the main interview room, the student athletes will make their way to the breakout area. So Jarrett and Norin's and three of their teammates, the other starters, will be available way down the hall in the breakout areas for your questions and their answers. And also from 2.50 to 320, Texas Tech will have the open locker room period for student athlete availability there as well. So from 150 to 220, we'll be in here 30 minutes with head coach Chris Beard by himself at first. Then he'll be joined by student athletes. Then the student athletes will head to the breakout sessions, the Texas Tech starters, and then all the student athletes will be available in the locker room from 250 to 320. Lots of availability today, lots of ways to get your questions answered. We're going to start right now with the head coach, Chris Beard. Hey, coach. Good morning. Afternoon. Afternoon. This is a reasonably good intro for this time of day. We'll get to questions in just a moment. Coach, your thoughts at this time? Well, the best thing about this, just to keep coaching these guys, you know, we don't want it to end. Looking forward to today, another practice, and then tomorrow, more preparation, and ultimately a game. So, um, you know, those of us in college basketball, when you talk about that uh, Monday in April, it's a special day. So, just so pleased to be coaching these guys um, on a Monday night. Couple of questions up front to the left. We'll start with Ben, then go to Brian. We'll make our way through the room. Uh, ben Bulch, Los Angeles Times. Coach, we always hear coaches say, embrace the process, enjoy the journey. You seem to be taking that to an art form right now. How are you able to do that and still get these guys so prepared to play as well as they have? Well, this is what we always do. So um, this isn't anything new. We have a process that we believe in. It has the academic piece. Um, it has the individual work, the shooting, the team practice, the film, the conditioning, the diet, the sleep, all sorts of things go into our process. But one thing we talk about from day one is just balance. You know, I think uh, you've got to have some kind of release. It starts with faith and family. And then ultimately, you know, the best players have a release. You know, I, I've, uh, I don't know Michael Jordan, but I've studied him as much as anybody. And I, I know he's very competitive with golf and uh, enjoys things like that. And all the great ones do. So... With our guys, we talk a lot about balance. We talk about having fun off the court and then being, you know, serious on the court. So on this trip, we're doing the same thing. We set it up as a two-fold plan. We, we're saying smell the roses, as I've been our terminology this week, or really in the whole tournament. That just means enjoying everything, but then also being us when it comes to basketball. Um, and I think we've done that pretty well. That same area of the room, Coach Brian. Chris, Brian Hamilton from The Athletic. When you were considering the Texas Tech job and talking to Kirby, I think you guys talked about alignment and making sure there was a, a well-resourced program. What, what in your mind is a well-resourced championship program, and, and how has it matched that last few years? Yeah, when, I, when Kirby and I met, it was a real simple conversation, and we just wanted to uh, make sure we were on the same page. But our expectations were to try to compete for championships 
and to have the resources and the mindset and the vision to do so. Um, you know, our goal's never been to like make a tournament. It's been to win the tournament. It's easy to talk about and really, really hard to do, but that's where we started this whole thing was just trying to have the expectations and the vision that we could, uh, you know, we could be relative. It starts by trying to be relative in the Big 12. You know, if you can get in the top half of the Big 12 and compete, then you can beat anybody once the tournament starts. That's been proven several times in recent history here. Um, so, yeah, the big thing with Kirby and I, I think we just shared the, ver the vision that we could be relative in the Big 12, which could ultimately mean we could be relative nationally. On the left side. Ben Golan with RedRaiderSports.com. Coach, uh, I got a two-part question. Part one, do you have an update on uh, Tariq? Um, no. Okay. And part two, uh, you've said all year that the reason uh, Matt Mooney and Tariq came to Tech is to play in big games in the NCAA tournament. So their performance last night, uh, they were both outstanding. Is that why you recruited them to Texas Tech? Yeah, absolutely. We recruited them because they're talented players, number one. We knew they could play in the Big 12. They both had proven numbers, proven body of work at the Division One level. Um, but the big opportunity at Tech, and I don't want to speak for those guys, is they know how much we lost from last year's team with Zach and Zaire, Justin, Tommy, Naeem, and Keenan leaving. Um, so I think those guys saw the opportunity to play on this stage, but also uh, the spot to, to make an impact. To the left of the aisle. Coach, uh, Ron Counts from the Daily Progress in Charlottesville. As you look at your starting lineup, all those guys were two stars, three stars, or in Mooney's case, not even ready coming out of high school. How has that kind of bonded this team, and specifically with Culvert? How has that kind of motivated him in his career? You know, I just uh, – I think the, the ratings and the stars and all that's good for basketball. It's good for attention and stuff, but it really has no relationship between that and winning. I mean, Zaire Smith wasn't a top 100 player, and he's 16th back in the draft last year. Um, you know, if anything, I think it could be a source of motivation. Every great player I've coached, I've always said, hey, print out that top 100. I'm going to put it in your locker. I'm going to put it in my office, and we'll put it in your wall next to your bed, and we'll go to work, and we'll see wherever, where this thing pans out. And with Zaire, it panned out pretty good after a year. With Culver, it's coming true after two. But... Um, you know, the stars are just where you start, and then they don't mean anything once you get to work. You know, it's about player development and working on your craft. And so, um, you know, I mean, the, you know, Steph Curry's a pretty good player, and he didn't play at a blue, uh, blue blood. So, I mean, you know, I just think the star deal is one part of basketball, and we respect it, but more important is the work you put in. To the right of the aisle, Ralph. Ralph Russo, Associated Press, Chris, and I asked um, Tony the same question, sort of builds off what Brian said. The, um, how much of building a program to get to this point is convincing people in the program, around the program, players, administrators, assistant coaches, that even though we haven't done this before, we can do this, we can get to this point? Well, that's big. That's the first step is the vision. And then you've got to get people on board that really believe it and believe it in front of you, behind your back, believe it at 10 o'clock when they're out of town on the road somewhere, believe it in the morning, believe it when they're talking to their wife or their kid. I mean, they got to really believe it. So um, our first year at Texas Tech, we had a great team. We were just close. We lost a lot of close games, but that's when the foundation started. And then last year with Keenan and those guys, that's where it became reality, where we really thought, hey, we can play with the best teams in college basketball. We're good enough to do this. And this year's team really benefited from the culture we established year two. But vision and belief are everything. You, and, you know, sometimes it comes off as a little bit of arrogance, but you gotta, you got to be willing to tell people. I, I've been telling people my whole life, I think we can win championships and play on the last night of the season. And the reason I say that is not um, arrogance. It's just belief in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, I know how much our guys are – on the practice floor, I know how hard our staff works. I know how we care for each other. Um, you know, when, when you got a, a group of people working collectively and you, you have the courage and the, you know, um, backbone to tell people what you think you can do, then that's when great things can happen. Coach, we'll stay in that same area on the right side. Hey, Coach, I know uh, by now you've probably seen the videos of the pretty wild celebrations in Lubbock after yesterday's big win. And if you're from Lubbock, we know that we can be excited, we can be rowdy. Um, but what do you think about the, the way they celebrated? And, and do you have a message for everyone going forward back home? Well, first of all, I know we have great fans at Texas Tech, and I know those students very well. 
And I just hate that the actions of a select few, you know, are put in Lubbock and maybe this light. But, you know, I, I've lived in Lubbock 13 years. I know the students. I know the people. And, um, you know, we have core values. But sometimes just a few people will do something. And I just hate that it kind of uh, puts that light on us. So my message, you know, in my, in my voice would be, you know, let's celebrate this. Let's enjoy this. But let's, let's do it in the right way, in a safe way. So... Um, but I want to recognize all the people that do do that the right way, all the people that spent their hard-earned time and money to come here. Our hotel last night was electric, but it was safe and professional and just good. Um, but I did see some of those things. It didn't make me happy, but um, I'd like to recognize all the, all the people that are doing it the right way. And hopefully the story isn't just those select few that made some bad decisions. Up front on the left side. Coach Greg Eklund, this is for NPR in Kansas City. Uh, can you tell me how, since you were talking about staff the other day, you crossed paths with uh, Max Lefebvre and if he'll be a good head coach someday? I appreciate you asking that. Max is my guy. Yeah. I hired Max at Angelo State University as a D2 graduate assistant. Uh, we basically got his master's paid for, and that was it. Um, he came, recommended to me through some basketball people I trust. Max and I talked on the phone every day for about 40 days, a month and about 10 days. And um, it's the one of the only times in my coaching career I've ever hired anybody kind of sight unseen. I don't, just because of the resources at that level, I don't even think we had a face-to-face -face interview. Um, but I just had a feel for Max on the phone. Everything he said he would do in those 40 days, he did. Hey, coach, I'll call you at 9.30 tomorrow. 9.30, the phone rang. Coach, I'll send you that tomorrow via email, and I just had a good feel. Sometimes, like in recruiting with players, you just have a good feel. But uh, Max, especially, he's contributed to uh, NCAA tournaments at Angelo State. He's contributed to championships at Little Rock and Texas Tech. We've graduated every player since Max has been with us. Uh, he's a special player. He's a special person. He relates to the players, and uh, he's a mentor to them. Um, he's not in a coaching role right now, but he was able to coach at Angelo State, so I've seen him in both avenues. But uh, Max is going to do whatever he chooses to do in college basketball. He's a rising star. We're going to move over to the right side, to the left of the aisle. Dan. Chris, Dan Wolken, USA Today. Um, pace and space is kind of a buzzword in basketball, but when you watch your team play, you guys don't really give people a lot of space. Why is your style so effective in the college game right now? Offensively or defensively? <laughs> Give Dan the microphone again. No, de defensively. Yeah. yeah, I know. I mean, somebody here ought to take a look at our offense the last 30 to 50 days of the season. You know, we, you know, we're, it's all related, but no problem on the defense. Uh, no, I think, um, you know, just a couple of years ago, people would hammer us in recruiting, talk about, don't go play for Beard and those guys. It's like positionalist basketball. And then all of a sudden, Golden State wins a couple championships and positionalist basketball becomes the hot thing. So now all of a sudden, we're cool again. Um, but we got interchangeable parts. You know, we, we don't have guys that are just one, twos, threes, fours, or fives defensively. We got players. And uh, it's one of many things I learned from Coach Knight. He's, he never understood what a one, two, three was. I really don't either. Um, in my generation, I ask recruits all the time, what, what was Michael Jordan? Was he a two? No, one? Th no, he's, in my opinion, he was the best post player in basketball. He was back to the basket late in his career. And I mean, LeBron, what is he? One, two, no, he's a player. So I think defensively, we have a lot of players. We're not in, you know, much positions. This allows us to switch and guard different people and stuff like that. So um, that'd be one part that, of our defense that, that I think is pretty, uh, pretty good. And we try to recruit to it. On the right side of the aisle, Jim. Thank you, Coach. Jim Roop with Westwood One News. Earlier this week, you mentioned in preparing you had one week to prepare for Michigan State, and you watched every game, every news conference. Now you have a day to prepare for this game. The challenge in that? It's very challenging. It's kind of a unique part of our sport. Um, but we've been here before. We've had five one-day preps this year. I think we had three one-day preps in the Big 12, playing Saturday and then Big Monday. Uh, this year was the first time since Coach Knight was in Lubbock we had three Big Mondays in Lubbock. Um, so we just rely upon that experience. I think in coaching, in your preseason, and your non-conference, you're trying to do everything to prepare for what could happen, and we've done that. So we, 
sometimes we'll schedule games back to back. Uh, sometimes we'll do the one in between. And so we'll just rely back on our experience. So the last thing we told the team last night is we reminded them that we've been in this situation before. We show the guys kind of visibly on the board how many sessions they're going to have between bed last night and tip off Monday. And we'll just rely on that experience. But it's very, very difficult. Um, now it is kind of a staff uh, collaborate effort now. You know, as you go through the tournament, you got different guys working on different games. But now everybody in our program is working on Virginia. So, um, but you know, no advantage or disadvantage either way because both teams are in it. Um, but it is a challenge. It, it may, it's, a, it's different when you have a week to prepare for somebody versus one day. On the right side, Kevin. Yeah, on that, uh, Kevin Brockway, CNHI uh, Indiana, on that subject of preparation, any early feel about the pack line, just how to approach it, how to deal with it? Oh, it's really good. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's as good as advertised. You know, I've watched a lot of Virginia games this year just as a fan. And then, you know, from time to time, we'll come in the office in the morning and somebody will be like, man, did you see they gave up 11 points in the first half last night? And we'll run to the film room and we'll watch a little tape. So um, I've been following this since Coach was at Washington State just as a fan. Um, when I coached in Division Two, we would always take, like, one team a year and just kind of follow their journey. So, I mean, I've gone through a season before with Duke. I've gone through a season before with Michigan State. I kind of watched the season and – we did about a half a season one time with Virginia. Um, so obviously it's no secret, you know, you got to move the ball around. You can't just come down and make one pass and go get a basket. So I think our ability to kind of move the ball around and get the defense shifting will be, you know, big for us. On the right side up front. Coach David Collier from the ABC in Lubbock. Um, at what point does everything that everybody's saying nationally about you guys become go from motivation for you guys to frustration? And do you think you guys are finally getting credit after last night's win, or are still are there still plenty of doubters out there? I just, uh, you know, we do a deal called a thankful text in our program. Time to time, we'll just come to the locker room, everybody grab their cell phone, and we'll send a thankful text. I think the foundation. Uh, for every championship team isn't style of play. It's not coaching, it's not players, the game changes. But I think anything any championship team ever has is a positive foundation. And to me personally, I've always thought positive foundation comes from understanding how lucky we are to be healthy, to be in this country, to be working in this game we all love. And so I think one of the best things you can do is just thank somebody from your past. It's very difficult to go out and be in a bad mood and have a bad practice if you send two thankful texts to people in your past. For me, a high school coach, my daughter, um, you know, it's anybody. And one thing I always tell the guys is, man, you got to thank the haters too. Um, I think maybe Jordan in his Hall of Fame speech said that, you know, and I, I get great motivation for the people that tell us what we can and can't do. So, you know, just keep, you know, just don't pick us again in this game. We'll see what happens. Right side to the left of the aisle, Allison. Coach Allison Williams, ESPN. Um, it seemed each one of these teams had their famous alumni in the stands cheering them on. You guys had Patrick Mahomes. What did that mean to you guys and to have him firing up the team the night before? Yeah, with Pat, it's just like personal because he's friends with these guys. You know, Norrence was at Tech playing when Pat was playing quarterback for us, so they're just friends. Um, but I've said it before, and it never gets old talking about it. Pat Mahomes is big time. Like he, it's not fake. It's not fluff. Uh, he has not forgotten where he come from. And it's not just tech athletics. It's the school. It's the community. It's our university. He's, uh, he's as good as I've ever seen in terms of not forgetting where he comes from and, and having a real love for, for Texas Tech and West Texas. So for him to be uh, at this game and talk to the team briefly yesterday was really, really cool. And he supported us last year, too. I forget if he was in Dallas or Boston, but he was in one of those. He's been great. Only problem I have with him is we can't get him on the fireside chat yet. Um, and I'm going to continue to try to do that. Coach, back to the left of the aisle toward the center. Coach, Mike Leslie from uh, WFA in Dallas. You talked about it a little bit earlier about the, everybody talks about your defense, and deservedly so. But the offense that you guys brought to the table last night, hit nine of your first 11 shots in the second half, the two big shots Culver hit late to clinch it. What are the elements of your offense that maybe aren't appreciated? Thank you for that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all related. I mean, you can't have a good defense if your offense doesn't, you know, go hand in hand. You can't be great offensively unless your defense, like, 
you know, I work for Tom Penders at Texas, and we were explosive offensively, but our defense is creating turnovers. It's creating 33% of our offense. Um, these great defensive teams like Virginia, this offense is contributing to the defense. It all goes hand in hand. So I've never been a big believer of this team has this identity or this identity. It, it goes hand in hand. The best offensive teams in college basketball have defenses that contribute to that. And the best defenses in college basketball have offenses. It's like, uh, you know, it's like in football, you, you know, the defense has got to get some stops. And, um, you know, an offense that, you know, an offense, you got to keep the defense on the field a little bit. And, you know, it's all kind of related. But I have a lot of confidence in our team offensively. Um, we have great players. Uh, we can score on all three different levels. We have, in my opinion, five green light shooters on this team. We've got ISO guys. And it's just been kind of a journey for us. When you get all these new players and you have 30 days to practice, but you really don't have 30. It's another NCAA rule that's just not true. You, two of the 30 are your closed-door scrimmages or your exhibition games. That's 28. No coach goes hard the day before you play a game, so now it's 26. And somewhere along the road, you're going to have to have some teaching practices. So really for us, we normally get 20 practices uh, before we play our first game. When you got new pieces, you know, we get the defense going a little bit ahead and the offense takes time. But it's always been our plan to be a good offensive team by February and March, and I, and I think we are. Coach on the left side, Joe from Philadelphia. Joe Giuliano, Philadelphia Inquirer. Chris, another Matt and Tariq question. Uh, how, are, how are they able to adapt to your culture so quickly, and what have you seen as their uh, most important contributions to your team this year? Well, they, they fit in and contributed so quickly because they wanted to. And I uh, said it before, you know, when you recruit guys, if you'll listen, the first three or four phone calls you'll have with a guy, if you'll listen more than you talk, you, you can tell exactly what a guy's about. And a lot of times in recruiting, you know, a guy wants to know about your roster and how many touches he can get and how many minutes and shots. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's a, there's a personal part of recruiting. Everybody has a, has a right to do that. I mean, there's a real selfishness to be great in this. You've got to find a spot that fits for you. But it's a fine line. You know, as coaches, you want guys that want to win. And with Matt and Tariq, it was just uh, unbelievable recruiting. Once they got uh, their releases uh, or declared themselves as grad transfers, both guys just want to talk about winning. I mean, all of our conversations, I kind of keep notes when I talk to guys, especially when I'm recruiting a lot of people so I can kind of get my mind right before we have the next conversation. But I listen a lot more than I talk early on. Believe it or not, in these situations, I sit up and talk. But uh, um, Matt and Tariq, all they wanted to know, man, is could we get back to the NCAA tournament? Um, losing so much from last year's team that I really believe that we could get back to this stage. But those guys are two of the most unselfish people I've ever recruited. It's not, it's not about them. Like, I remember an early season game in November. We're coming back down the tunnel at the USA in Lubbock, and we just won a game. And I'm uh, looking at the stat sheet, kind of walking back to the locker rooms. Always want to give the guys one mathematical part of the game. And Tariq had only scored like two baskets and gotten a couple rebounds, didn't play many minutes, probably a coaching mistake. And you always wonder what that locker room is going to look like when you get in there. Man, Tariq's jumping up and down like he hit the game winner, hugging the guys that played more minutes than him. And I told Mark Adams right there, this team's got a chance. Uh, this unselfishness is not fluff. This is real. Up front to the right of the aisle, Jeff. Chris, you told me that the year in the ABA was one of the most satisfying of your career. Was there a point through those jumps, D3, D2, that you thought that this would never happen, that you'd never get back to being a Division One head coach? I didn't really think about it. I didn't really care. I, I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to win a national championship. Um, I wanted to graduate every player. I wanted to like get teams better. I wanted to just, you know, fall back in love with the game. Not that I ever fell out of it, but went through that adversity and stuff. And uh, I can honestly say that I never, uh, I was just a great piece with myself. I like kind of disappeared that year in the ABA. I wasn't really, no offense, I wasn't checking the Goodman blog. I, I really got disconnected from college basketball a little bit. Uh, Frank and Fig and those guys were down the road at South Carolina and I would watch games at night, but I probably uh, got distant from talking to my college friends. I just coached my team every day. You know, we had no rules in the ABA in terms of like restrictions. So we would do individual workouts in the morning, team practice in the afternoon, and I would hang out with the players at night. So it was really like a basketball vacation. I kind of lost myself in the game that year. We're joined now by Texas Tech student athletes Jarrett Culver and Noren Zodiase. 
We'll take questions for the student athletes and for Coach Beard over the next few minutes. Let's go to the left of the aisle on the right side. Talk Raleigh News and Observer. Uh, you've taken three pretty key members of your staff from NC Central. I assume that Brian led to John, led to Brandon in terms of that process. But what have those three guys, Brian Berg and those guys, what, what have they meant to kind of what you've been able to do at Texas Tech and in Brian's case at Little Rock? Yeah, Brian Berg is a rising star too. This guy's going to be a, a head coach sooner than later. Um, he's, he's the real deal. He's coached at all different levels. He knows the game. He relates to the players. He's a tireless worker. He's come up the hard way. Uh, he's won wherever he's been. You know, people always ask me sometimes, not always, but sometimes, hey, what do you look for in assistance? I mean, start by, do they win? Brian's won championships everywhere he's been, and now Jarrett and Orange could speak from their perspective. But, um, and then I just have a lot of trust with Brian Berg. I've known him for a long, long time. And uh, he recommended John Riley to me. Um, and so, yeah, Brian Berg's a big piece of this story. Uh, he's special. He's deserving of a head coaching job. Midway on the left of the aisle, and if this question isn't for the student athletes, the next one's going to have to be. Go ahead. Okay, uh, Chris, see, Adi Joseph from CBS. I'm wondering, you talked a lot about how you convince people to believe in your vision. You're making a national championship. You don't have to convince people to believe that you can get here. Um, how does that change your perspective on the program, and how could that potentially affect future recruiting for you even? I don't think it will. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be a guy, you know, wakes up tomorrow just to try to put ourselves in a position to win, and I'm sure when we wake up Tuesday, it'll be about recruiting and trying to get back. So uh, I don't ever want to change kind of who I am and wired. I just always want to be a guy that gets up every day. I, I, um, that's just kind of how we're wired. Me, me and Culver talk about that. Me and Norrence talk about that a lot. Like, we just don't want to speak for these guys, but we just wake up every day trying to prove that we belong again and validate and validate everything. So I respect the question, but I, I just uh, I just don't think uh, I don't think I'll ever change kind of how we're wired. This question is going to be for the student athletes. Let's go up front to Alec. Alec at becoming the Shiners Hospitals for Children. Um, this is tomorrow is going to be the biggest game of your guys' careers. You guys have played in hundreds of games in the past. Um, what specific moment will you guys think about that will help you guys for tomorrow's big game? Let's ask Norrence to take that question first, then Jarrett. Really the journey, uh, everything that took us to get to this point, the process, the blood, sweat, and tears that got us to this moment. Um, we don't take the, the process for granted, the long road that it took to get here, uh, battling with your family, with your brothers to get here. So that will all pay off tomorrow. Uh, we just got to stick to the process and do what we do best. And, Jarrett, what will you think about? Uh, yeah, like Norris says, just the journey. In. I mean, we started this summer, came together, and our chemistry just keeps growing each and every day. So. I mean, we're all playing for our brothers and playing for each other, so we got one last game, and it's for the national championship. Center of the room. Coach, uh, Joe Yeager inside the Red Raiders. Uh, what is your definition of a tough basketball team? I like the hat, man. <coughs> BU. You. Uh, you know, when I think of toughness, obviously it's the physical part, but if you don't have that, you can't even compete at this level. But it's, you know, having the physical uh, – makeup um, but then to me it's mental toughness you know it really is I think for the most part when the ball goes up every game teams have enough physical talent to get it done it's just the mental part of the game and that's why I have so much respect for Virginia I mean um, I've never seen a more mentally tough team you think about um, how their season ended last year and then to be right back here one year later that's just incredible mental toughness They've had the two games in this year's tournament run, you know, that you've got to give yourself a chance all the way to the end. That's mental toughness. I mean, you have these grind out long possessions. That's mental toughness, the discipline they play with. So, um, you know, just like with Michigan State, you know, I said, well, there's no way we're going to out tough anybody. We got to match it. You know, I don't think we're going to out tough Virginia's mental toughness. We just got to match it. All the way to the right, toward the front. Yeah, Chris and Norrence, the. Um the things you guys have talked about, the self-sacrifice in the name of excellence. I'm wondering a couple of things, when the moratorium on the, de the desserts and the beer will end, and also what, what effect do you think the uh, self-denial can have on the program going forward? Lawrence, do you want to talk about mobile phones first? It just gives a, 
a chance to get some rest is discipline. Uh, whenever you need, whenever you have discipline, it can lead to great things. For our younger guys, even for our older guys, it's a good reminder just to keep your phone away, don't don't listen to distractions, things like that, and just lock in in the game plan and, and get rest, and, and that's really helped us this season. Coach. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, this is just like today's world. You know, these guys can't put their phones down. and I see it with my own daughters and stuff. And, uh, you know, a lot of times a guy will put his phone down but leave it on. He thinks he's getting good rest. You're not. You know, you, sleep is where you sleep. It's a part of our process. Um, you ask the average person how much they sleep, they don't really know. Ask Kobe Bryant how much he slept when he was an NBA player. He'll tell you to the minute. And so, first of all, it's just a part of our process, and the cell phone keeps us from getting the sleep that we need. And then just this time of year, it's just human nature, you know, to read all these things about yourself. But um, our deal is we came here to play 80 minutes of basketball. Now we got it down to one day prep, and we just any five minutes that our guys are sitting there reading something, I'd rather them be sitting there, you know, reading something about Virginia on, on the video screen. So it's just simply about eliminating distractions is what it is. Up front, left of the aisle, Allison. Hey guys, this is for both of you. Um, I asked Coach this already, but just uh, what it meant to have Patrick Mahomes before the game kind of firing you guys up out there in the crowd. And I know you guys have a bit of a, a history with him, so just what it's meant to have his support. Noren's first, please, then Jarrett. Pat's a good friend of mine. For him to come uh, speak from his heart, he riled us up. He was very excited, energized to, to be there with us. He's a great ambassador for uh, Tech Athletics, not only us, but other teams. And so he's just been great all year for us and the other teams. Jared. Yeah, you know, just seeing what he did this year, uh, getting MVP. I mean, you got the MVP of the NFL talking to your team. So it always gives us motivation and confidence. And just seeing everything he did kind of, you know, motivated us to go out and he believed in us. Um, it's always good to have him around just talking to us and just, like kind of like a role model to us. Matt, we're going to use the back left microphone and the questions left of the aisle up front. Ben. Uh, ben Balch, Los Angeles Times for the players. Um, I know your coach would probably say this isn't about him, but what, what's it been like for you to see him become kind of a breakout star in this NCAA tournament? And, and what would you say has his, been his biggest imprint uh, on you and this team? Norens, first again, please, then Jared. Uh, it's expected, honestly. Uh, you see this guy day in and day out, put in work like no other. Uh, he's sickly competitive. He, he drives us, he drives our coaches. He, he pushes the standards higher, higher, higher. Um, it's expected from, from the day I, I met him to, to now. He hasn't changed. Just the mindset and, and the toughness that he's employed on this program is none other. And uh, it's deserved what he's getting right now. I know he, he'll he really reflect on the season after Tuesday. But we have one more game to go, and I'm glad it's with him. Jarrett. I always expected it since the first day I met him. Uh, he's a tireless worker. Um, he brings the best out of you, no matter if you're a walk-on, the best player. Coaching staff, GA, he, he brings the best out of you. He works hard and he never gets satisfied. He always wants to win. And I mean, winning is important. And I mean, that's what it is for us. So, I mean, I just seen it. I expected it from him. Time for one more question right of the aisle in the center. Uh, yeah, Tori Larned with KMAC News in Lubbock. A uh, question for Jarrett. Last night, Michigan State uh, tried to shut you down. Luckily, you guys have a strong roster with Mooney to pick up the pace, but you're going to play another def strong offensive team tomorrow night. How are you going to try to get some of those open looks? Um, yeah, Michigan State did great. It just shows how great of a team they are. And I mean, it shows how great of a team we are. We got a lot of pieces to our team. And I know the coaching staff are going to have me ready to play tomorrow. And I mean, I'm going to study the film and do what I can tomorrow. We want to thank Coach Beard and Jarrett and Norens for joining us here in the main interview room. We want to wish them all the best of luck for tomorrow night. Thank you, Coach. Great job. Great job, fellas. Jarrett and Norens.